Okay, so I'm here with uh, Bill Harebird. Uh, you're a uh, uh, visiting scientist at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts um, and uh, Director of Climate Analytics. Um, if I've got my uh, various titles the right way around. Um, and I'm just wondering if we could ask you a couple of questions uh, about the kind of 1.5 degrees target and versus the 2 degrees target. Um, uh, first of all, I know that you're advising uh, some of the small island states uh, here, um, and, and 1.5 degrees is a very important uh, number for them. Uh, why is that? Well, the small island developing states and the least developed countries are worried that the impacts uh, that would occur at 2 degrees warming or above um, uh, are going to be extremely damaging for them and so they uh, want to see warming reduced to levels lower than two degrees um, and indeed uh, back below one and a half degrees as soon as possible. So their concerns really are, are about survival, about ensuring that they're not overrun by sea level rise or the encroachment of deserts in the case of a number of, of least developed countries in Africa caused by global warming. Now, obviously, this is a this is a huge challenge. Um, it's a technological challenge and it's a, a political challenge. Um, I guess you've been following these talks for uh, uh, quite a long time. Do you think there's the political will to to move to 1.5 degrees? Well, it's certainly uh, technically and economically possible to get to one and a half degrees and, and lower in the in the long run. Um, the economics of this indicate the costs are, are, are rather modest to at least get a long way there. Um, so what's, what is missing at present is the political will to take the first critical steps. Uh, and what we see out of the Copenhagen Agreement, uh, based on our research, uh, are insufficient action to date to bring emissions low enough in 2020 to have um, anything like a decent chance of limiting warming to either two or one and a half degrees. And, and what kind of, uh, what you say it's, it's, it's possible uh, technologically and, and, and economically, what are the steps that are going to be needed to, uh, to, to, to put this into effect? Well, to get to low levels um, of warming, um, e even such as the European Union's target with a high probability, means you have to throw everything at the problem. There's virtually nothing that you can't uh, think you wouldn't need to do. Uh, so, uh, but the first real steps required are for countries to actually agree they want to go in that direction and agree to commit themselves to make the reductions required because in a, in a very real sense everything else follows from that. Um, so what we have in Copenhagen is insufficient commitments from the industrialized countries. Um, here we needed something like 25 to 40 percent reductions by 2020 from the industrialized countries. They committed to um, you know barely 10 to 12 percent actually in real terms. Um, and uh, from the developing country side, um, I think the, the level of commitments was, were also disappointing. So China, for example, put on, on the table only an international target, or I should say pledge, which is uh, nowhere near as good as, as its own domestic policies. Um, and across the board, I think, uh, we saw a failure to really rise to the level of ambition needed. Um, so I think that Right now, we're faced um, with a kind of crisis of, of will, um, particularly after Copenhagen. Um, despite the spin that many put on it, it's quite clear that the level of, ambi of political ambition is declining as a consequence of the rather paltry and poor outcome from Copenhagen itself. And, and are there any success stories? Um, we've heard that you know, China hasn't put these international um, pledges down sufficiently. Um, the US certainly hasn't. Uh, Europe again, kind of um, dithering over the weather to increase its uh, emissions cuts pledges to 30%. Are there any? Is there anywhere we can look towards and, and say, hey, you know, this is it, it, it can be done and it's working? Well, gra gradually we're seeing more international finance coming on the table. We're seeing moves to tackle uh, deforestation with significant amounts of money behind that, so that's positive. But on the other hand, you know, I think one has to be realistic about it. Um, the level of ambition is, is, is um, declining. Uh, we see uh, Canada's pledge under the Copenhagen Accord was a lowering of its earlier announced goals. Australia recently abandoned its efforts to introduce an emission trading scheme and consequently has moved back towards the lowest end of its pledge, which uh, would be very difficult to meet even without its emission trading scheme.
Um, there's now questions coming about Japan's commitment with the change in leadership there. Uh, I think overall the pattern is not particularly good at present. So the, if the political will is, is lacking, the question is, is what can be achieved at talks like this, I guess, um, you know, without, without the political will. We've, we've got time, people are saying there's only a couple of weeks of negotiating time left between now and Cancun, but if, if, we, could, if we could put together an agreement politically, then I'm sure that the lawyers and, the, uh, and, and everybody else could put together a, an agreement technically. But without, without political will, what hope is there for these talks moving forward? Are, are we seeing any progress? I think without political will, uh, being real, being evidenced here. Um, it's very difficult to see significant progress on any of the main agenda items. There's certainly a much better spirit here, uh, a much better sense of cooperation uh, than we saw, but there's a risk that that's just because there's nothing at stake. Um, and I think what we're seeing, as soon as we get to anything really serious, we're seeing uh, blocking happening. I think there's a sense also of common purpose lacking here. By that I mean uh, we spent a long time building this regime, the international community, uh, billions of dollars and euros have built this system up, but now we're seeing some countries um, showing a lack of interest or willingness to move forward with it. Instead they're wanting to replace the regime uh, with something else of their own making. Um, so the United States is giving off signals um, that it, it really would prefer that there be a different regime than the one we've got, and a particular one of its own design. And there are other parties also giving mixed si si signals. So in the past, the parties, whatever their differences, have been united around the common purpose of building the regime. And I think that's beginning to disappear. And do you think there's a, a risk of the uh, the process collapsing as a result of this um, lack of engagement? You know, Eva de has been consistent in saying that it needs to be you need to maintain this um, consensus-based decision making. And and but actually, uh, if if it gets to the end of this week, for example, and the negotiating text that comes out from from the chair isn't acceptable to all parties, or we get more blocking throughout up and up until Cancun, is there a risk that the talks might get taken elsewhere into a, into a kind of a less open? Um, a venue, or, or is, you know, are we going to continue to um, with the current pattern? I think there's a serious risk that the um, climate regime will fragment into many disconnected pieces, um, and I, I, I think that that risk is is not receding, um, and in many ways it's it's growing, um, and I think this year could be the year that, where we see that that this is decided. I think if we get to Cancun without being able to agree on a package of issues to go forward, um, then the pressure on governments to be seen to do something, anything, will lead them, for good or bad reason, to start to do things elsewhere. Um, and of course, if countries are, are not helping to do things within the system deliberately, um, then that will only contribute to the regime fragmentation. So it's quite a sobering message, I think, in terms of the, the governance of, of this process, and yet quite an optimistic message in terms of the, the potential and the, the hope, you know, the fact that we can achieve a 1.5 degree uh, target, and, and it is, this is possible economically, technologically, so I guess it's a case of uh, trying to mobilise people for, to, to build the political will. I think that's correct. I mean, the technological economic optimism can't survive too long in the face of political realities that don't change. and. You know, unfortunately, we're in the position now that the, the, the physics of the climate system and the history of the emissions that we put in the air mean that we appear to have a relatively narrow window now of, of taking action um, that would be feasibly able to limit warming to even two degrees, let alone one and a half degrees. If we don't really get our act together um, within the next decade, then um, unless there's some new miracle economic technology out there, uh, then I'm afraid um, it will become impossible to limit warming to low levels. So maybe just, just to finish then, how, do, how does uh, that relate to Yves de Boer's comment in his, his press conference yesterday saying he can't see sufficient mitigation um, targets being hit in the next decade and, and yet then he followed that up by saying, you know, I think we'll solve it by, by 2050 if, if there's this uh, narrow window, how, how, how do you, what's your response to that? 
Well, um, maybe Ivo knows something about the technology that I don't, but I, based on what we're seeing, the window is very, very narrow. And you'd have to believe that politicians are prepared to go after 2020 three or four times faster than they're prepared to go now in order to believe it. That's a sobering assessment. Okay, Bill, thanks very much for joining us and I uh, hope we'll see you later in the week.